So I want to first start off and uh, thank everyone for giving me this chance to share some, uh, some different stories, not just of my own, but also from the students that we work with within this organization called the Tour for Diversity. Um, it's been an amazing experience that I've had to be a part of, as well as uh, bring together these different pieces of uh, our stories as the mentors, as well as the stories of the students themselves. So we always start off uh, our presentations with the college students with this quote from former Surgeon General, um, unless the current trend is reversed, our country will see a growing ethnic and racial disconnect between those who receive care and those who provide the care. And this is something we've heard as a theme through a couple of the different talks so far. Um, and to go along with this, we always talk with the students about disparities that exist within patient populations, as well as the disparities that exist in, um, in the backgrounds that make up our healthcare professional student population. So we have a whole list of things that, when you look in the literature, can be considered um, backgrounds that would make someone be considered disadvantaged um, or underrepresented. And while those might not be the best terms to discuss where these students are coming from, that's kind of the current state that we're in. Um, the one piece I do want to, to, uh, to point out, though, as we talk about this context of these backgrounds of these students, is this understanding of this kind of this pipeline to medicine. And this can be expanded to pipeline to health careers, pipeline to STEM fields. Um, regardless, the struggles that I think we see across those disciplines, really there are a lot of shared similarities. We have a lot of leak points within the system um, where there are disparities that exist between access to services, whether that's related to the quality of those services or even the quantity. And what I mean by quantity is how many times are there these you know, particular touch points for these students when it comes to these types of activities. For me, before I was a medical student, I taught middle school science. I had done enrichment programs for elementary, I had done high school programming, and actually when I was a college student here at Stanford, I started with um, pre-K interventions as well. So I've seen this entire pipeline I've done curriculum development for students at all points in this aspect. And one of the struggles that you constantly see is these students have the motivations and the interests, but there tends to be a lack of awareness of what else they need to do to get to that point. Um, and that's really where we sit when it comes to thinking about how do we use um, these diverse pieces of students' backgrounds that would make them assets to medical or to the healthcare system um, and actually find ways to get them to continue through. And one thing to keep in mind is that you know, there are many problems at many spots, and there are multiple solutions here. One of the struggles that we have when it comes to pipeline programming is we tend to try to go back to the same things that we've used over and over. And we really need to begin thinking about how do we innovate in this area? How do we do something different that's going to reach students in a way that we haven't done in the past? One of those ways is the organization I, that I'm here representing, the Tour for Diversity in Medicine. You know, we often hear that you know, we try to get students to come to us. They come to us at our medical centers, they come to us at national conferences, to come to the pre-med fairs. But the struggle is there are a lot of barriers that exist preventing students from necessarily doing that. Whether it's cost, whether it's location of the conference, whether it's timing with their academic schedule, or even a basic thing that we sometimes forget about, the student's actual acknowledgement and awareness that these events and opportunities exist. And so that's partly on us in these fields of thinking about, well, how do we provide outreach for these students? So to combat this major issue and to reach some of those students from uh, diverse backgrounds that I mentioned in the first slide and that you heard from Dr. Maldonado, the Tour for Diversity was created by two physicians um, with a mission to educate, cultivate, inspire future physicians and dentists of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds by forming local connections in order to fill a national need. And the local connections is a strong major part of this organization because what we do is we go to the students. So two times a year, we load up 15, about 15 mentors coming from diverse backgrounds. Um, these mentors are physicians, re uh, residents, medical students, dental students, pharmacy, wide range of things, and we are hitting different areas of the country, and we're literally traveling by bus. So you can see that over five years, we've conducted 10 bus tours. We've managed to hit 28 states, almost 50 stops, which is over, uh, over 40 college campuses, which includes community colleges. 9,000 miles have been driven on the bus, which equates to sitting there for 140 hours. 
like I said, we have about 35, 40 professional mentors. And the biggest part for us is that there's been over 3,600 students who've come through the Tour for Diversity programming. For me, I first heard about the tour going back to immediately after their first, uh, the first tour. I was drawn in by the novelty of how they approached going to these students and kind of getting them the information they need. Um, it was something that I recognized that, in my background, I had done a very poor job of understanding what I needed to know to be a successful applicant to medical school. And so being able to combine those two worlds was something that was very interesting to me, to the point where now here I am, because of my educational journey of being an MD-PhD student, I've actually participated in seven of those 10 bus tours. Um, so my numbers are you know, seven tours, 28 states, I think it's 42 stops, um, something like 3,000 students who I've been able to interact with through the different presentations. But having that scope of who I'm able to talk to, of how much we're able to interact with them, is a big reason why I've continued to participate. And in particular, one other thing that really drives me, especially from the educational side, is this slide. Um, this is a little snapshot of three tours of the different schools that we've gone to. Each school is an individual line. Generally, red is their scores or whatever that topic is. They're below the national average. Yellow is around the national average and green is above. So one of the things that really differentiates the Tour for Diversity beyond us going to them are the schools and institutions that we go to. So these students are coming in with lower scores than the national average. These schools that we're going to tend to be rural institutions. They also might be minority-serving institutions, for, such as HBCUs or HSIs, the um, Hispanic-serving institutes. But then one of the things that we also see is that the education that sometimes these students are getting and the awareness of what they need to do to be successful in applying to medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, um, there's, there's a little bit of a gap especially when you look at the graduation rates, not just at four years, but at six years for these students, there's a wide range here. I mean, there's a couple of schools that we've seen where they had graduation rates in the teens. So these students were paying for six years of college to have a 10% chance of being able to finish just their college undergraduate degree, let alone be able to make it to the next level of what their interests were. And we see that reflected in when we talk to these students. We see that reflected in the advising that they're able to receive. We see that reflected in the administration and leadership. And there's a lot of struggles that these schools face and a lot of levels to this. And we try to address as many as we can. So our programming itself is directed towards the students. We also have workshops that are directed towards the advisors and to any administrators who are willing to come because we recognize that we are only there for one day. So the long-lasting effect is going to be from whatever happens with um, the advisors and the administration once we leave. So we want to get them as hooked up as possible. One of the assets, another asset, I think, of the Tour for Diversity are our mentors. So it's a very select group of people who have been able to participate. And some of it is because we're all volunteer, and you have to be willing to take off that whole week to do this bus tour, which is not the easiest thing in the world. Um, our mentors are wide range. We have students, which now encompasses medicine, pharmacy, and dental. We've had residents and fellows, who a lot of them actually started as medical students and then have continued in. We have early career professionals in medicine, dentistry, podiatry, pre-health advisors, as well as people working in a wide range of, um, of whether it's academic institutions, government, nonprofit research, and whatnot. But one of the things I think that really stands out is that the mentors keep coming back. So over almost 70% of the mentors participate in multiple tours, meaning they're just as sold into this and just as invested in this as I am, as well as the directors, and understanding the mission and why this is an important thing. And furthermore, when they're participating in these other activities, that's including the bus tours, that's including participating in webinars, the blogs, administrative duties that we might have. Um, so people are not just sold to this idea that we have to provide mentorship, but really sold to the model that we've gone with for the Tour for Diversity. One thing that I think is really cool that I get to do as a student on the tour and who's part of the research team is kind of share the stories that we've collected from the undergraduate students. So in one paper that we published, we looked at the students' perceived barriers to pursuing a health professional career. So we conducted focus groups through multiple tours and basically had a chance to sit down with about 50 students 
who just shared with us different challenges that they faced. And unfortunately, there wasn't really anything new. When you look at the literature, whether it's STEM, whether it's other health careers, we saw a lot of the common things. Inadequate resources, limited personal resources, social family conflict, um, this lack of information, whether it was mentoring or advising, societal barriers, these things continue to persist for these students. So what we had, this, the next thought was, well, let's talk to another group of students and see what are their solutions to these things. And this is a piece that we're, that's currently ongoing for us, where we're taking those, that first set of topics that students addressed and say, well, how would you fix this problem? And what's interesting is they're coming up with some of the things that we already are trying to do, you know, have more outreach programs, things like that. But then another part is, goes back to the awareness issue. These students know that they don't know where to get this information. They don't have an easy source to find it. So they're asking for databases of resources that connect all of these pieces so they have one common place to go. They want to find ways that they can get involved earlier in the process. They want to know, how do I outreach to an institution when you're telling me that I need shadowing opportunities? How do I outreach to them to get those opportunities even though I know that it's been a struggle? And so they're really trying to think outside the box of how do we solve some of the problems that we know that, um, that exist for students like us. So ultimately, I think for the tour, it comes to three innovations for how we do what we do. The first is the pre-tour with the site selection. So like I mentioned, it's the where we go, the types of uh, schools that we attract and try to work with um, in doing this. Um, the second part is during the tour, the storytelling. One of the things that we always do, and this kind of is in concordance with everything that we've heard so far this morning, is we get the students to own their own stories understand that their path to medicine or dentistry or pharmacy or whatever it might be in health careers is their own story and they need to own that, whether it's the struggles or the achievements that they have in it. And I think one of the other pieces that really connects for the students from the mentor standpoint is that we are very comfortable with sharing our own failures in the process. That's, I think, one of the pieces that really separates us from other groups um, when it comes to these mentoring pieces and what makes being a mentor is so difficult with the tour, is you have to be willing to own up where you failed in the process. For me, a lot of that failure was kind of how I approached studying in my undergraduate career. And so students think, oh, he went to Stanford, he knew everything that he needed to do. But that wasn't the case. That wasn't also knowing the educational background I had leading up to it. What sort of resources did I have? How did I understand how to work and process information? All those things set me up for the challenges that I had in college. And that's what I talk with the students about. And then the third point of where we really connect with them, um, two ways. One, social media is a big, a big platform for us. What's interesting is over the years, we've actually seen the students transfer or switch from Twitter usage to a lot more uh, Instagram usage and Snapchat. And so we've really gone that way with what we do with them. Um, but another piece is when students reach out to us, keep them connected within this kind of tiered mentorship family. So anytime a student recontacts a tour or a mentor, we get them hooked up with usually a student. If there's a fellow, we will, or a resident or fellow, we will, as well as some sort of faculty member. So there's always at least two or three people from the Tour for Diversity still in contact with these students when they reach back out to us. Now, unfortunately, it's, you know, we're not able to do this for all of them. Like I said, we've, if you look at all the tours, over 3,600 students, and we have about 40 mentors. The math there is a little bit difficult, but, um, but we do put some of that onus on the students to reach back out to us. And when they do, we keep them in. And we've even had a number of students who've participated in Tour for Diversity tours, then come back as a, med or as a mentor when they were in medical or dental school. So the approach for us, really to challenge the traditional mechanisms of outreach and go to the students on their home turf. One of the bigger things for the mentors is about embracing the failure in your story and then trying to continue the mentorship past that first engagement. And one piece from my research side is really trying to document that evidence of what we're doing with them and really what that means in the long term. The last two things I want to discuss, kind of to put it in this picture of where we stand with this diversity 3.0, um, is how do we expand this work that we do as a whole? So in, I have two bricks. One is the short term, one is the long term. In the short term, I think we really have to invest early and often. We have to think about community engagement programming as well as needs assessments of the educational systems around where we're doing this work. 
And we really have to widely think about what the partnerships are. This can't be something that's solely done from an academic medical center. It has to involve the community, has to involve nonprofit organizations who can provide other support, and it definitely has to involve the local educational systems. The second piece is thinking about how do we do this long-term, big picture in the future. And I think one of the things, especially as I've heard some other speakers today, is we have to reframe this discussion about pipeline programming. And for me, because of my background and interests, there's a huge intersection between health and education. And we have to begin thinking about these things as how they're linked. We know that there can be a negative impact from educational outcomes on health outcomes, not just of your family or you as an adult, but then how that cycles to future generations. And so we really have to begin to think about it as we do this pipeline work. It's not just about getting them into health careers. It's really about how do we improve their educational status to improve their health status as well. So with that, I would like to thank everyone who's been involved with us with the Tour for Diversity, our founders, Dr. Matthews, Dr. Landry, as well as my mentor and the research coordinator, Dr. Freeman, my institution, Rush, Me or Rush Medical College, for the support that I've gotten over the years, and uh, all of our supporters and everything. So thank you guys for your time.